start to think about yourself as a brand um, because you are right. You even if your brand is your your the name of your company that has a brand. If it's not specifically you, if if your name is in the is you know on the on the marquee, then the brand is you. But if you know the if the the company has a has a different name, it's not yours. That's it's still a brand. It represents a set of feelings and emotions that you're going to express in stories that are going to be attractive to the clients that you most want to serve. Welcome to the Designers Oasis podcast. I'm your host, Kate Bendewald, interior designer, mama, and CEO of a thriving interior design business built on authentic word of mouth referrals. It wasn't that long ago that I stepped away from my corporate architecture job to build my own dream, one that would allow me more time with the people that I love, the ability to serve my clients at the highest level, and to make a great living. It wasn't always easy, and I've made my share of mistakes along the way. Fast forward to today, and I've learned a thing or two. This podcast is for you, the inspired, creative, ambitious, and let's admit it, occasionally overwhelmed interior designer who shares this dream of transforming lives by transforming homes. Join me and my guest each week as we walk through practical ways to build an interior design business you love and helps you transform your clients' lives. You can do this. Thank you for letting me spend part of this day with you. Let's get to it. Today, I'm chatting with Erica Sorit of Sorit Creative, a strategic brand marketing and storytelling agency for interior designers and home brands. Erica believes that how you tell your story matters. It needs to be clear, concise, and consistent. And she's going to talk more about that today. She is on a mission to help interior designers clarify their value and to get that message out. She says that interior designers are underestimated and undervalued for their work. They're brought onto projects far too late for a scope of work that doesn't take advantage of their full potential. And she wants to help you fix that. Erica shares the three pillars that you have to understand and get right in order to shift from being a business to a brand. There is so much value packed in today's episode. You're definitely going to want to tune in for the whole thing. Let's listen to Erica's conversation today. Hi, Erica. Good morning. Welcome. How are you? Hi, Kate. I'm really good. Thank you for having me. How are you? Oh my gosh, I'm fantastic. I am so, so, so good. Thank you for asking. I have to tell you, I am a little bit fangirling over here <clears throat> about uh, having you today. I, <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I, um, <laughs> I was introduced to you through, you know, your partner, and I started to go down a major rabbit hole just researching um, you and your firm and your work that you do. And as I mentioned in our chat just a minute ago before we got started, that I branding is really important to me. And and when I say branding, like all the aspects of branding, not just the visuals, but the storytelling. And then, of course, because without saying the experience that you provide your your clients, um, so. But the storytelling is something that I find to be really fun and energizing and interesting. And it's always so different for everybody. So Mm -hmm. um, when I was talking with my assistant, Megan, I was like, this is an easy yes. Let's talk to her. (laughs) So welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here. And it's truly an honor to talk to you too. I love your podcast. And I love that you're providing so much insight to designers who need it. You know, we, we're all working in different kind of aspects of this industry and everybody has their own approach, uh, you know, but we all struggle with, uh, I have found in my business, we all struggle with how, what are the best kind of ways, what's the best process or systems to run a business. And there isn't, at least from my experience and my education, it's really hard to find sort of one, one source. So I'm grateful for you and this podcast and, and the value that you bring to designers to help them understand and explore all the aspects of building their business. So 
well, likewise on the fangirling. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, this this community is really special to me. I mean, uh, just the the craft and the the love that I have for interior design as a whole, you know, is one thing. But then just doing what it means to designers to have a business that can thrive, that is something yeah. they can call their own, that provides them, you know, a good income that allows them to take their families or do whatever it is that they want to do outside of work. It just, it delights me. So, and, but you know, there's so much to running a business and, yes. you know, from the process to the clients relationships and all of that. But um, what we're here to talk about today is storytelling. And so uh, m- Erica, you are a strategic brand marketer and uh, storytelling expert specific to the home industry. And yep. I love that you have chosen this for your niche because it's so needed. I want you to, well, I love a good backstory. So if you don't okay. mind, kind of give me a walk us back a little bit to your yeah. journey to get to this uh, place where you are in helping designers and home brands uh, okay. storytelling and, and getting that message so clear. So the super, super short headline, the story, my story is that the first half of my career, the first 10 years, I worked as an interior designer. I studied fine art and then I went, I went to art school and then I went to design school. And, um, and then after I finished design as a graduate program for interior architecture, I, I began my career in design and I worked all over the world and, um, it was super exciting. Um, and then about 10 years ago, over 10, a little over 10 years ago, I got pulled into doing kind of more marketing roles, more business development, more pitching for our agency, for design um, firms. Um, that evolved into a kind of more solid position in marketing where I was more happy. Like I was happy to leave CAD behind. I was happy to leave oh, wow. wall sections. <laughs> Because what I was starting to realize was that my skills lie in communicating the value of other people's. What I was able to do best, and I did this in various kind of parts of of my career before that. Um, I was always good at drawing. I was always good at um, you know maybe the presentation boards, which is back when we actually had to still do physical boards when we were presenting to clients, um, you know, before everything went digital, um, even in when it went digital, how to create kind of something really quick, a story really quick, um, a headline, um, some quick copy that was, you know, really, a, you know, interesting and fun to read, something that was memorable, something that the client, if they were seeing multiple, you know, pitches per day or multiple, um, you know, presentations from different clients um, that they could easily remember. I was really good at that. And I really loved doing that. And then going back and kind of building the rest of the design was sort of like, womp, womp, womp to me. <laughs> it was like, okay. <laughs> this is really interesting. I want to take a yep. pause for a moment because yeah. I've talked with my designers. I call them my designers in a very loving way, not in a mm-hmm. like parental way. <laughs> I hope that's yeah. through. Um, yeah. That, you know, when you can hone your storytelling craft, it's not only something you will do for your business, but it's also something you'll do for your clients yep. when it comes to developing the, the, the design that's story for them. Beautiful yeah. way to say it. Mm-hmm. started is what you're saying yes. is that you found that storytelling capability it came naturally for you when it came to your your project work and I yeah. in my researching of you I, I saw some of the firms that you had worked for these are huge firms doing yeah. incredible work can you talk a little bit about the kind of projects that you were working on yeah so I um I started working and again just to go back to kind of the storytelling the <laughs> the my focus in graduate school was on exhibition design. So I started working right out of school with um, Ralph Applebaum Associates in their office in Beijing. So it's a U.S. company, but they specialize in museum design. And what you know that firm is really famous for is telling stories about history that are engaging and really kind of unforget- unforgettable. Um, the f- you know first kind of landmark project for that firm was the Holocaust Museum, and so the idea, yeah was if you've ever been, you you know, or if you've heard of it as an interior designer, it's sort of set about the idea that museums weren't simply about a place to learn um, 
about history, to read, a, see a timeline on the wall or to read a story about, you know, a particular, you know, battle or <laughs> a particular event that happened, they could be more experiential. They could be immersive. And when they were, that kind of storytelling, whether it was done with objects in space, whether it was done with how your body moved, right, how the experience of the design moved you through the space, whether it was done with like the size of the graphics or, you know, really everything about how you took in the information of that story of history impacted you and left you remembering it <laughs> or being impacted by it. And so I was so excited by that. I was thrilled, you know, I was just changed by this work. Um, and I, I wanted to do that as a designer. And so I started working um, in the office in the Ralph Applebaum office in Beijing and our clients around, this was around 2008. And while the U.S. was going through a recession and the designers and architects and friends I had working in the, the built environment um, weren't working on such exciting projects or weren't working at all. Um, you know, China was booming. China was kind of a place to go and work on projects that, you know, would never be built anywhere else. Um, and so I had this incredible experience of being, you know, led through a time when we could do, you know, the clients wanted to see things that had never been done before in space and in cultural projects, which is crazy because typically cultural clients are quite conservative. Um, and so, um, yeah, I really got to work with a lot of exciting, um, brands while I was in Asia. Um, and I did that. I was in Asia about seven years total, um, transitioning between design and also into a marketing role there. So super, um, super exciting start. Um, but I will say the one thing just to take us kind of back to sort of what's driving this as a, as a thread in my career is the one thing I always saw with being in design school, I taught for a few years at the university level just after graduating um, and then kind of going into practice. What I saw was a lot of designers kind of shied behind their work and didn't tell the story. They wanted their work to really speak for themselves, speak for itself. People will just get it once they see my renderings. Like, well, no, they won't. <laughs> they didn't and they don't. Um, and what I saw, unfortunately, was a lot of really, really incredible ideas. I say, die on the presentation floor. They, they just fall down and they never can get back up because they're missing, you know, something quickly that can help people understand exactly why it should be important to them. And that's typically that the story is, is written in the point of view of someone else. Um, most of the time we start stories, we talk about ourselves. We talk about our, our experience or our idea, um, our style, um, the reason why we, you know, the whole story behind why this is so important to us, but clients don't care about any of that. Like clients, corporate clients, residential clients, clients of any kind, they only really want to know how you can make their life better. And so I saw this across many years, um, took me a long time to really put it together. Like, what's this? Like, how do you really succeed at this thing? Like, what's really making all of this work? And that's what I figured out it, it was. And then I, I found a kind of a, a universe of information and marketing that helped support that. And now my mission in, in this business of mine, <laughs> in my work, is to help and guide designers to understand how to tell their stories in that way so that they don't die on the presentation floor anymore and that they get the projects they deserve and they get to help people, their clients have better lives. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. I could go down so many rabbit holes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And, and you just listening to you, it's, it's resonating with me so much that I, I think that you can't grasp the importance of storytelling soon enough. Uh, right. Because it shows up in so it shows up everywhere. It shows up in your your visuals, you know, how you show up uh, on yeah. and in social media, but it also shows up in your conversations that you're having in those mm -hmm. virtual phone calls. It shows up in your proposals. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> yes. And of course, again, <laughs> um, you know, the storyline might change, the characters in the stories might change and evolve. But uh, the, the impact and the value of storytelling um, 
it just it resonates with people because we're we're as you know yeah. knows Brene Brown <laughs> you know we're yeah. her story <laughs> I I have that exact same thing same exact way and I love that she has been able to say that like we are wired for stories they come in our like deepest kind of deepest 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 memories just as ourselves but even as we've evolved throughout the history of humanity like imagine sitting around a fire there's no social media how do you tell people like that you know i don't know something's dangerous <laughs> don't go past the river <laughs> there's there's wolves and bears you know how do you share senses of danger um or senses of things that are are positive or maybe nutritious. I mean, just going back to being very sort of primal about why storytelling matters, but go back and take it to your, to yourself, like how you grew up. How did you learn about your family? How did you learn about your culture? Or how did you learn about, um, you know, what really brought you and gave you an existence and an identity? And that was a story I'm certain. Um, and just to take this quickly back to designers and marketing, if I were to say to you, <laughs> <laughs> Kate, right. Kate, like, let's say we meet at a networking event um, and maybe I'm potentially a client or, you know, I'm, I'm interested in potential. I, you don't know. I just say, Hey, what do you do? How's it going? Like, hi, America. Who are you? And what do you do? What do you say? No, it's funny. I was just thinking about this <laughs> earlier. But I used to have this pretty clear when I was doing design work, but mm -hmm. since I have transitioned in the last year full time to doing Designers Oasis. And so much of my work is is digital and it's online. It, it, mm -hmm. It's something that I really need to focus on myself for Designers Oasis. I mean, I like to say that I help interior designers to uh, launch establish and scale their interior design business so that they can, you know, have a career that supports the kind of lifestyle that they want. And I guess that's, I think that's, no, 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 that's great. <laughs> that's great, actually, because one thing that I, the one thing that makes a story, a story, and it can be, you know, a variety of things is you just got to get people to lean in. You've got to catch people's attention. And you had me at, like, of course, if I'm coming to this as an interior designer, I'm coming with like, oh, make my business better. Okay. <laughs> make me, help me make more money. Help me streamline my processes. Help me like work less. Like those things are really interesting. And you spoke about those. Like when you introduced yourself, you caught my attention. You made me lean in. You're going to make me feel something about obviously my business. Um, if this were, you know, a networking event. And I think that's a great, that's a great story and a great way to think about it. A lot of times people get kind of over, they overthink it, you know, wow, what am I going to say that's profound and <laughs> unique and like, yeah, you can do that. Well, that's of course. Yeah, I do. And I, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I could work, you know, be better on is telling that story about how, how creating a business that thrives can help support the kind of lifestyle that you want, you know, and yeah. you know, balance, because that's the piece that is so important to me. But anyway, the, yeah. um, this is, this is really um, exciting for me to hear. I want, I, I want to ask you this question. What is the one thing that you see most often with, I'm just going to speak about interior designers because that's mm -hmm. our audience right now. I know you work with yep. product-based ho home brands. Mm -hmm. What is it that they underestimate or that they get wrong most often that you wish you could just shout from the rooftops about storytelling? So I, I come to storytelling with a framework that is based on it, really the headline for it too is to say, are you thinking about yourself as a business or a brand, right? Uh -huh. If you're thinking about, yeah, if you're thinking about yourself as a brand, you're going to want to make sure that you f are leading with what's going to make you obviously different. Um, but as we just spoke in the example before, it's like, you're going to want to make a, something that's resonant. You're going to want to make a kind of an emotional connection with the person that you're talking to, you, you need to know enough about them as your ideal or your target or your, you, you know, that, that perfect client profile, what it is that motivates them um, 
on an emotional level to want to work with you or to want to choose you over another brand. So as this, in a sense, brands function specifically because they are able to tell stories really well. So the, the, the biggest thing I want people, designers to think about is start to think about yourself as a brand um, because you are, right? You, even if your brand is your, your, the name of your company, that has a brand. If it's not specifically you, if, if your name is in the is you know on the on the marquee then the brand is you but if you know the if the the company has a has a different name it's not yours that's it's still a brand it represents a set of feelings and emotions that you're going to express in stories that are going to be attractive to the clients that you most want to serve so that's the first thing um, i call that emotional resonance it's really getting the the core and key emotional motivations that drive people to you. Um, and then once you uh, figure that out, <laughs> and it requires a lot of, you know, why, 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 lots of questioning. Yes. <laughs> Just getting started and they're, they're kind of doing this for themselves. Mm -hmm. obviously you guys would be the experts to, to help designers with this, but if they're just starting yeah. to think about this, asking why, and then asking why to that is yep. so important. Like, you know, yep. okay. Can I give you an example of, of a, of a client that I yes, worked with where this really benefited because mm -hmm. we got to the core of what's really going on. You know, this couple came to me and they said they wanted a kitchen renovation. Well, okay. I do kitchens. Great. Why? <laughs> why do you want a kitchen mm -hmm. renovation? And long story short, after continuing to probe and ask why and ask why and ask why what it came down to was that they had children who were um, getting ready to, to, to age out of the house and go off to college. And they felt like they weren't seeing their kids the way anymore as much as they used to. And they missed that connection. Mm -hmm. And ad admittedly, their kitchen was dark and cramped and small, and there was not really a good place for them to kind of gather in the kitchen. But yeah. food was really important. Gathering was really important. They had a pizza oven. They love to, to, um, you know, do a big pizza buffet where they put out all these toppings where they could make their own. They were just a really, oh. really, really <laughs> fun and lovely, <laughs> lovely couple. I, I was one of my very, very early clients. They were, they were wonderful. And so what it, what it came down to was she wanted to spend more time with her kids and she, they both did mm -hmm. both couples and, and they felt like having a kitchen slash dining space that was inviting and gave their kids a place to come hang out and work on their homework or bring friends over, mm -hmm. you know, always have the food at the ready and the drinks. Cause they talked about how much food their kids ate <laughs> would create this space that would invite their kids to, to linger and to hang out. And yep. when you got that story, like, okay, now we're cooking, like literally, yep. <laughs> literally, it wasn't about the kitchen. Yes. They wanted it to be cool and, mm -hmm. and all this and functional and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. But what they really wanted was to spend more time with their kids before they moved off to yep. college. How freaking cool to be able to be a part of that and to help them. Uh, that. That's the heart of what makes interior design so important. And that is why the messages is so important because you're <laughs> uh, let's build on this. Cause I, I think we can play on this for a second. I want to go into some other things. Imagine continuing to tell that story back to the client who comes to you and says, I just want, you know, we, we need a new kitchen renovation. Okay. So there's some reasons there. Obviously that is if they ever decide to resell their home, it's going to help with the, you know, resale value. Great. That's one reason they may be, they may be focused on that and you can go as that your marketing message, but obviously they're going to make space for their kids to come. Potentially the kids are want to come back you know, again and again through their college years, because they're going to have all these great memories of this time they had together just before they left. Right. And that is about connectedness and creating a sense or a place of belonging that the kitchen is as just a series of, you know, materials and, and appliances holds. Right. And your just, your job as a designer is to be able to communicate that back to the client. And if you can, I'll layer on another message on top of that is because I've had a lot of designers come to me who are either very early in their career or 
they don't just don't realize how to take, you know, they're saying, oh, everyone's saying, you know, they're creating spaces for families and, and maybe they are. But let's say you take on top of that the maybe you're kitchen and bath specialized. Maybe you have a particular type of education or training or accreditation in specific types of rooms or systems that you can add on top of that, that give your client another way to understand how different you are from other designers who might be saying the same thing. Um, And then if you were to say that same message, you know, over and over again, across, let's, and, and to be pretty consistent with it and in making it short and saying it across all of your different channels between social media, between email campaigns, if you're doing them on your website, for sure. in any, you know, pitches or proposal documents that you send to clients, they're going to remember you as the one who can help transform their family's kitchen and their and really transform the the relationships they're having with their family um, much better than someone who's just offering an, a service of interior design without being so specific. Yeah. And that's the power, that's the power of messaging. Um, it's different for every designer. I like to say when a lot of designers are talking about style, you'll be talking about substance. Um, because it's one thing to show pictures of kitchens and I see them a lot on websites. But for someone who's not versed in the language of design or doesn't understand what it takes to build out a space like that or the value of it, if you're adding words on top of that that describe belonging, connectedness, you know, even telling a case story. I love this story so much about the family and, you know, the pizza, pizza bar at home. <laughs> I just think you you've got a winning formula for landing clients that are looking for this and I think a lot are. Hey designer, are you tired of wasting precious time with prospective clients who are not a right fit? Do you experience imposter syndrome because you know the back end of your business is kind of a hot mess? Perhaps you're experiencing growing pains and you don't have the tools, resources, or team to support you. I get it. I've been there. As an ambitious interior design business owner myself, I know the roller coaster ride this can be. Over the years, I've learned a thing or two about running a profitable word of mouth design business, and I want to help you find success too. How would it feel to wake up and face the day knowing exactly what to focus on next having a roster of enthusiastic clients, including a paid wait list, and having the space, time, and creative energy to develop projects that you are proud of and are portfolio, if not pressworthy. I want to invite you to learn more about the Interior Designers Business Blueprint, a business coaching program designed exclusively for interior designers who want to serve their clients at the highest level while making good money, but without the burnout and overwhelm. If you're ready to get off the roller coaster, you don't have to do it alone. Join me inside the Interior Designers Business Blueprint and get the tools, teaching, and community you need to pave the way for an interior design business your clients love and you are proud of. To learn more, grab the link on your audio player or head to designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. That's designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. Can you talk a little bit about your process um, and how it's different? Because there's there's other people out there in your space yep. that, you know, do storytelling and that, that kind of thing. Of course. <laughs> how, yeah. how is the work that you guys different than, yeah. than others? So there's two ways that it's it's pretty radically different. Um, so first is <laughs> radically different is that um, <laughs> uh, we've obviously come from, I have two partners that I work with, it come, all come from a background in interior design. So we understand the industry, we understand the struggles and the pain points that designers go through in marketing their their business. Um, so we understand pretty much the entire commercial and residential space and all of the things that go into it. Um, The second is I have um, created 
what, what I call in the E3 storytelling framework. Each of these words, yeah, are unforgettable because they start with an E, just like Erica. Um, but they describe um, how to take a business strategy, how to take a look and what we've talked about just recently, um, how to take a business strategy and turn it into a story. And that the three E's are, how do you create an extraordinary position? That's, that means how do you make yourself you know, different and unique. Let's say in the in this example of the kitchen, um, you you talk about your accreditation with designing potentially kitchens or baths, um, if that's if that's something that you have, or you can talk about your experience in doing. You know, how I've had many designers who tell me over and over again how they attract clients that like to cook. They want to be amateur chefs, and so having a really well laid out kitchen helps make that better for them and helps that dream of their own to cook for their family come true. Whether they're able to articulate the idea of connectedness or not, they're able to articulate their own hopes and dreams of cooking at home. So even without the accreditation, if they've done enough kitchen design, they understand like what it really means to be a good, you know, like to make a good kitchen design. There's a, there's a differentiator there that if you speak to clients will, you know, begin to understand. So that first extraordinary positioning is understanding what makes you different and being able to really articulate it, make it really into like something that like one or two sentences that really makes sense. Uh, The second one is what we've been talking about is emotional resonance. And that's understanding what the core emotional feelings and motivations are, um, what people are going to take away What are they going to remember about you? I've identified five. I think that interior designers work from a sense of belonging, right? Creating a sense of belonging um, with their clients. And mostly that's about families and space. The second one is um, being seen or heard, being validated. A lot of times clients come and they want to be, and this can, there's a range of different kind of reasons people want this, but sometimes it's about wanting to entertain more, wanting to have, you know, you know, maybe they are transitioning in their life to either an empty nest or maybe they're having more children or they're, you know, there's something that needs to show up as a sort of being, I can be seen and heard as a family or I can be seen and heard as a young professional. Um, There's some validation there and that interior design can help them articulate that as well. Um, I I believe strongly that one is tied to um, the idea of creating a legacy. And I see this a lot with clients who are building second or third homes um, or creating homes that are maybe homes that they will leave to family um, or they are, they're going to be something that stays in, you know, in a generational kind of and creating experiences for the next generation. Uh, and then my favorite, <laughs> which is one about discovering, um, it's about awe. It's about creating a sense of wonder and that wonder happening from understanding something about yourself inside and understanding something about the world as a, you know, at your place in the world. So you, you discover something about yourself and you're discovering something about a world. This one I see much more for product brands than for interior designers. Their clients aren't using the home to kind of necessarily discover something about themselves, but tapping into one of those um, is really the first, the first way to understand the core emotion. And then you can build a language uh, of storytelling around that. And the third one, now we'll get to it, (laughs) is experiential engagement. So we have extraordinary positioning, finding out what makes you different, creating an emotional resonance, finding out what that core motivation is. And the third one, experiential engagement. And that's really making sure that that story can be implemented across every touch point you have with your brand. That's how people will encounter your narratives um, from, you know, anything physical from your, uh, I don't know, the the mat outside, you know, your welcome mat. What does it say? <laughs> does it have anything to do with your brand? Or what's it like when someone walks into your office or your studio? What's that experience like? Does that speak to the message that your brand is is putting out there? And all the way to after a project is delivered, um, are you making, pro- you know, are you making things right if there's something is damaged or if you install and the, you know, if there's a many, many, many things that I won't go into the details that, that can happen kind of at the end of a project, but typically this is what the clients, like what 
they remember most. And so you want to make sure that your brand touch point that you're, you're touching on and creating a story there for them that's consistent with what they experience when they first find out about you. And you have to control all those things. It feels like a big, a big, big, big undertaking, um, but it's not. Uh, it just takes time. It's like anything else worth doing. <laughs> it's just a matter of being consistent and being intentional. And, um, and yeah, that's how you build. That's how you build a brand with a message. Well, you clearly have been able to do that for yourself and your own brand. And I, for Thanks. anybody who's not watching the video version of this, I am sitting here quietly, but I am just nodding <laughs> in, in agreement with everything, but there's, you know, a couple of things that I'm so glad you mentioned this because I think that there is, especially for young designers, this um, misunderstanding about what brand is yeah. and they, they miss that part about the experience mm -hmm. and those touch points. And that is where, uh, you know, my passion lies is creating a, a really extraordinary experience that, you know, exceeds your client's expectations. It delights them at every you know, phase of a project. Um, and that part is near and dear to me. And that's the part that I really teach on. You know, I'm, I enjoy storytelling. I appreciate it. I, I have, you know, worked on that for myself, for my own business, but I'm not an expert in that area. Um, so I'm really glad that you mentioned that because uh, it, it's, it, it's not enough to have beautiful graphics and this, the, you know, the, these like um, catchphrase words or whatever that yeah. sound good if you're a hot mess on the back once they start working with you and the wheels fall off. That's you. Brand. You've yeah. <laughs> you nailed it. It's so so true. And I think designers get what I see a lot of times is people trying to. Um, quickly accelerate the process of looking professional or looking like they have it all together um, with a logo, with, um, you know, even for designers just getting started. And I think this happens outside of design also. I'll just say they're, they're more of a company than a business, right? A company has a website, it has a logo, it has collateral, it might have a social media page. A business has revenue, right? Has all those things but it has res revenue too, right? It's actually being able to exchange whatever, you know, product or, or service for money, right? And again, within businesses, they can run in a variety of different ways. I not <laughs> conversation with, there's a specific company that is coming to mind for me. Okay. That you're describing them, but go ahead. I'm yeah. <laughs> No, I was going to say, but the third thing, so we have a company, we have a business, and then we have a brand. Right. And so a brand is when all of these and, you know, some brands don't do it well. Right. They they they, <laughs> they either flounder at the the last part. Right. They're not able to keep up with the, you know, the customer kind of satisfaction side of the experience um, or they do it wrong or they they have to find they find themselves in crisis after some bad decisions. <laughs> and we know all we always know those companies, um, but they, you know, Brand is kind of the, the sort of summit of how to kind of build up. And, and when you're a designer just getting started, you really need to be focused on generating revenue. Um, but so investing in your brand might start on a sort of smaller scale. It might start with you thinking about, you know, what's really resonating with my clients? What is that emotion? How can I, if I can't do it right now, if I can't, you know, invest in even the time to start to think about that story, what it might be, how do I gather enough information to be able to find that later um, when I get there? At the risk of being uh, sued by this massive company, I'm just going to name them. Restoration Hardware is a company that comes to mind that has put so much money into their marketing efforts and any designer who's listening to this and has gotten their ridiculous catalogs um, you see the storefronts yeah. and you see how much money they pour into this visual identity mm -hmm. the product behind it and and customers clients who don't know homeowners who don't know the difference and yeah. don't understand how products are sourced and they don't understand what's on the other side of that transaction but once mm -hmm. that transaction happens you are enslaved to them until you get your stuff which 
might fall apart very quickly. But the product quality and the customer service, and this is not a dig on the people that work on the floors, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the in the throes of trying to make people happy when they have no control over the, the actual product. This is not a dig on them. I'm talking about the, the higher ups who are responsible for this. But the the customer service is lacking too. And and, and I just I was in this community group and we're having this conversation because it just keeps coming up again that this company continues to, to mm -hmm. deliver. And this is an example of a business, not a brand, but you wouldn't right. know the difference because from the outside, it looks like a yeah. big shiny object. You know, you I mm -hmm. I go to Cherry Creek here in Denver and I see the store and it's and it just looks like from the outside they've got it all together. Yeah. But then once that transaction happens, that's when you see things start to fall apart. And so yeah. the difference between that company and I, I, if I were had a second cup of coffee today, I could come up with an example of somebody who, who does it better, but I'm I'm at a loss. But you know, there's so many other companies out there that that they might not have. You know, who comes to mind? Lee Industries, which is a oh yeah, yeah, I, I love them. So they don't have yeah. the flashiest website, although it did mm -hmm. get a recent upgrade. Um, but their product is incredible. Their customer mm -hmm. service and the reps that we work with are are so good. Yes, their lead times are longer, but I will stand behind that product mm -hmm. because it has it has worked for me over and over and over again. Um, so anyway, that's my little tangent. And if I already really come after him again, but I'm not worth much these days. I will say, I, I, I will say from a brand strategy point of view, if you think about like what they're doing is over investing in the initial phase, which is the customer attraction side. Like, how do you get people in the door? Well, you make a really spectacular physical experience in a, in a shop or in a retail environment or in a, now they're doing hospitality. So you just maybe restaurants. I mean, it's like a full kind of experience. You, they get you in the door, you're blown away. It smells good. Everything's soft. Maybe you get a nice coffee, maybe some wine and maybe someone's there taking your order. You know, they've taken, they've invested in that experience, which is great. That's important. That's called the awareness and kind of decision phase of marketing. What happens after that is when someone's made a purchase and someone maybe potentially has a problem or the order's delayed or something starts to fall apart because there's, you know, is there a warranty? Who do they call when something is late or damaged or needs to be repaired? If they haven't invested as a brand in that sort of last phase of um, the customer experience, the, like you said, people are going to start to remember that. Conversely, what you just mentioned about with Lee is this the opposite. You know, they they potentially haven't invested as much in having like a flashy front end kind of attractive part of their marketing, but they really deliver when it comes to taking care of their customers. And what's you decide what matters to you. I know because I talk to both brands and designers, what they really care about. I know designers really care about looking good in front of their clients, not wasting their money or their time and not wasting really damaging their reputation with a brand that's going to pull a fast one on them <laughs> or leave them out to dry when there's a problem. Brands really care about that because they want to serve designers with the best experience and they want them talking and telling each other because you know we're a great community. <laughs> yep. And saying like, hey, you may not have heard of them because they're not on the front page of whatever. They don't, they don't have, you know, a big marketing budget. But if you really want good product, this is where you go. And so as a designer and as a brand, you decide where you're gonna invest. Um, and I would say try to spread, try to spread your investment across all phases. And that's that kind of experiential part of the framework is to make sure that you're you're standing behind something that you want people to to talk about and think about and lean into. Yeah. Yeah. No, and 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 I I, I appreciate that you're drawing attention to the fact that it all matters and that yeah. you know if if one piece of it is overly invested in or overly emphasized um, it can feel disproportionate to, mm -hmm. you know, the experience or vice versa. Um, so thinking about yeah. creating, you know, the, the initial attraction phase that is going to be reflected all the way through 
the very um, end experience. Um, what when a designer or or brand or firm starts to take this storytelling seriously and they take these these three E's that you just looked at and they maybe they work with you to help them mm-hmm. develop all of that. Maybe they're they're you know just getting started and they don't have that kind of budget and they're DIYing it, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Let's say they get it right, right? Like they yeah. they start to experience the benefits of doing this. What can you kind of talk about what those benefits are and what 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 will shift? What do they expect to what can they expect to experience on the other side yes. of implementing what we're talking about today? Yeah. Well, first everything will feel easy. Like everything, <laughs> all of the marketing you need to do, anything you need to say or talk about when it comes to like, when you go to a networking event, you're going to be like, okay, who can I talk to? <laughs> or you're going to, <laughs> you're going to, you know, it's, you're not going to sit on Instagram. I hear this a lot it's from designers. Like I'm, I'm so sick of Instagram because I don't know what to say anymore. Like, I don't have any clue what to post. I don't know how to make you know, not even how to make a reel. I don't even know what make a reel about. <laughs> but once you have a kind of a clear story, right? There's a a series of of laddering, um, you know, elements to that story, which you can then start to extract that will help you with that content creation. Um, but the first kind of signal is definitely that the marketing is easier. The second is it's it's easier, like I said, to talk to other people about your business and that they'll have something to repeat. I love to say once you have a solid short story about your business, you can onboard new you know, team members. You can onboard, you give them more of a sense of purpose in their work. You help them really kind of understand what they're doing has meaning and value, not just to your clients, but as their value value inside your company, you onboard them easier. You have, like I said, a script that's repeatable that your partners, people who bring business to you can share, like mm-hmm. realtors or architects or developers or builders, whoever it is in your world that's kind of helping to share. They're going to say, oh, man, she really gets kitchens. She's the kitchen master. She understands how to, you know, do that for people who want to be and feel like amateur chefs. She does it for families who like, you wouldn't believe what, you know, this, this family now does. They have a pizza bar, la la, and the kids come home every weekend. There's like a whole kind of like easy to remember story and script that they can share that might help bring business to you faster and quicker. Um, And obviously you'll attract clients that this storytelling makes sense to <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So what you're saying is like, it just makes it easier to communicate. Everything. Yes. Everything it takes a weight off your shoulders. It really does. Cause you're not saying like something different to everybody you talk to. You're really solid in what you do and why you do it and why it's different than other people and why it's important and meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it also gives you a filter too for like what projects yes. take and what kind of clients to work with. You know, if they're not in alignment, yeah. the kind of storytelling you want to be capturing, um, mm-hmm. it can help give you that filter. Um, and and I think that the biggest thing that I see designers in, in my community and, and in this industry struggle with is just clarity on yeah. on what to be focusing on right now in business. And there's just, there's a lot, right? Running a business is hard. There's a lot about, there's a lot of hats to wear. Um, And so anytime you could do anything that provides more clarity in your business, um, it's something that will pay dividends. I think in the long run, Uh, Mm -hmm. you, you, you can just start to, there's just it's like a flow. There's a hum that yes. happens, and and that's that's the zone you want to get into, right? And mm-hmm. and does that mean there's not going to be bad days or hard days or the occasional blip in the client that no you know, shows up? You're like, whoa, how did they get through? Like, <laughs> hide here, I, alert. I say that from experience. You know, I was I had a really long stretch there for a number of years where I just consistently getting just amazing clients that I love to work with and we'd come back for more and we'd they'd refer me to friends and it just was like it finally felt like oh my gosh I've really hit my stride you know and then you get this person that gets through the 
through the all sort of facts. And this was a repeat client from before I had like honed my thing. So I, I retroactively or retrospectively was able to see what happened. But all of a sudden you're like, whoa, what just happened? How did this Oh, how, how did this happen? <laughs> That's an aside, but I think what you shared is so important is just, you know, doing this work can help you get clarity. It can help give you a mm-hmm. filter and it just helps everything to flow and it gets yeah. easier. So I love that. Um, yeah. I, I know that you have a really cool um, brand audit tool that you put on. Yes. Would you mind sharing that? Because you know how mm-hmm. to a tool. Oh yeah. So brand audits, easy, easy, easy to do. And it will help you understand right away where your message is. Well, first it will show you very clearly if you're being inconsistent and unclear, which is what you want to know right away. Um, Second, it will show you where you need to, you know, prioritize fixing the message first. Um, So you can download, I have just a super quick, like one page, um, PDF, you can fill it in on the PDF if you want to type it. That's your process. Or you can take screenshots of um, each of your different media marketing channels and put them together, um, you know, into a visual doc if you're a visual person. Um, Or you can um, write it down. In fact, if you have, you know, that's a process too. But um, it's on my website, Sarit Creative, S-A-U-R-I-T, creative.com slash brand audit. And what it does is it allows you to um, go to each, each different channel. Like I said, first your, your website, what's the very first line of copy someone reads about you as it, does it say I'm an interior designer? Does it say, you know, I, we craft extraordinary kitchens for extraordinary family families or something. What is that first line of copy that someone's going to read when they land on your homepage or your landing page? Um, I also want you to Google yourself, Google your business and see what comes up because a lot of times if you've built a website a few years ago or someone else built it for you um, or you're just, maybe you don't have one yet, but you want to make sure that that's a super important part. That's sometimes the very first touch point people have with you. Um, They may click off, you know, an email or they may click from you know, someone refers you, they may click over to your website um, or they may Google you, right? So whatever that SEO copy says, it needs to be consistent with what you're saying in the rest of your channels. So you want to make sure you, you update that if, if it's out of date um, or if it's off brand or off message. Go to, um, you know, any other touch point. And that's going to be what's in your email signature. What is, um, you know, what do you say again at a party? Uh, is there any other collateral where there, your message is a headline? Um, and you want to put all these together on one page and just take a deep look. Um, and, and it will give you <laughs> the first step in um, straightening that, getting, getting that story straight for sure, but also in kind of understanding like where you need to start. And these are very fast changes once you have the message to update really quick. I never thought about going through and taking screenshots to see mm-hmm. how does this visually yeah. compare and then are the same messages coming through on each of these channels and yeah. if you're a designer and you're listening to this, some, some other, some of these channels you could be thinking about. <clears throat> Obviously she mentioned your website, Instagram mm-hmm. is, you know, designer favorite Pinterest, uh, yep. how's your house profile. It doesn't matter if you're a paid, if you're a paying user or not, you yeah. still <clears throat> can. And I suggest should have a profile there. Mm-hmm. Um, LinkedIn is, yes. you know, an often underestimated resource, yes. I think. Uh, are there some other places that come to mind that I haven't mentioned that we spell off? I would say don't discount the physical touch points too. Like I said, your yes. business card, if you're using a business card, um, but any kind of like if you're in a local directory um, or if you're any kind of community profile, um, don't forget about those. If you are with, you know, ASID or IDA and you have a blurb somewhere, go dig up all of those. <laughs> Anywhere your your business is mentioned and you've kind of given a description of what you do, a short bio, um, you need to include those and just make sure everything is updated and consistent. And do that once a year, guys. <laughs> yeah, <Right>? minimum. <laughs> minimum. 
So I'm just going to recap the three words that kept coming up for me yes. today when listening to you is that your messaging needs to be clear, needs to be concise. Yes. I always need to work on that one. <laughs> it's so long-winded sometimes. And it needs to be consistent. Yeah. And emotional, I will add. Um, yes. We got to find a C word for alliteration, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh my gosh. Um, and so Erica, before we wrap up, do you mind sharing um, if somebody wanted to come work with you uh, mm-hmm. to say, you know what, I'm ready to to hire a professional to help me do this. Yeah. Um, what are some different ways that folks can work with you? Yeah. Um, I have two, two ways of working with me. One is to work with me one-on-one in something called brand camp, which is super fun. Um, but it's two kind of 90 minute work workshops virtually where we go through the E3 storytelling framework for your brand. Um, we really dig into what that core emotion driving the you know decision from your clients looks like, what your differentiators are. Um, and we do that one-on-one um, in the first session. And then in the second session, I present to you all the ways that you can apply, I create a quick message for you um, based on the information we've gone through. And I show you how to then kind of, like I said, there's a ladder of content you can create once you have that narrative. Um, I show you how to create content for social media, content for a blog or an email campaign, how to create, um, how to apply it to your website. And then go into there, some visual design principles, which I think are really key to reading and perceiving our written messages when they're on like a, a digital, like a website, or even um, and if we're creating any kind of other collateral or anything. Um, and that's Brand Camp. You can sign up on uh, where you can find out more information on my website, um, saritcreative.com slash brand camp, all one word. And I even, in fact, just started offering scholarships to that. So once a month, I'm giving away, yep. Yeah, one brand camp session to um, a designer, either who demonstrates financial need, they're just starting out, or they have other reasons why they really are passionate about their brand, but they just can't afford um, to invest in brand camp because I think what we do is really important. Um, that the more, you know, designers who can communicate their story clearly to the right clients. Obviously they make their homes better. They make their lives better. And then eventually it sounds so dreamy, but maybe one day eventually we'll all make the world a better place just through design, through interior design. So this is my way of, um, you know, trying to solve interior designs brand problem a little bit and helping, you know, helping, helping pay it back to the people who supported and helped me. So that's one way, brand camp. And the second way is I, with my partners, we do a full um, six month brand roadmap service, which is a, a, an engagement. So brand camp is kind of a done with you approach and brand the brand roadmap service is a done for you. We do everything, your new website, we do all your socials, we do all the updating of any kind of... Um, email launching campaigns, um, blog posts, just to get it all out there. And, and that includes also visual design, which is one of the things that we do different that a lot of other um, you know, services that focus specifically on messaging don't do. So yeah, <laughs> lots of two ways. <laughs> You've got some options there. Um, yeah. So and I love the fact that you're doing a scholarship. I, that really uh, rings true for me. And I love that you're you're giving back in that way. Yeah. Um, I will link to all of this inside of the Thank show. Thank you. So we'll make it super you. easy. If you're listening, to go uh, check out their work. Uh, Erica, I am so grateful to have this conversation with you today. And me too. Oh. I'll share. I love it. And I hope that we can have you back sometime to chat more about all things. I would love to. I'd be honored to. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for letting me spend part of this day with you. If you're loving this podcast, please share it with a friend who you think might also love it. Or perhaps you can take just 30 seconds to open your podcast app and leave us a five-star rating. And if you have just an extra minute, go ahead and leave a review. 
This helps me so much and it helps other designers like you to find the podcast. It also adds fuel to my motivation to keep making great episodes just for you. However you choose to help, please know I appreciate you so very much. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Today.